So what I'm trying to talk to you today about is um, understanding the potential of genetic research and how this can be used to inform our future um, screening techniques and treatment for, for disease like obesity and type 2 diabetes. And I, I want you to come away from today realising the, the potential and the role of genetics in these diseases. Um, so this is a, a graph taken from the Washington Post. It shows the change in BMI since um, the 1970s, I think, to the 2000s. And the main thing I want you to see from this is that if we think there was one factor contributing to the obesity epidemic, uh, this whole graph would just shift upwards. But what you're seeing is some bits are going down, some bits are coming up, and there's this really sort of a unique pattern that's moving. This really highlights the multi-dimensional factors coming in to, to driving this. And environment is certainly a very important role, so is genetics and how these two interact to, to relate in the outcome. The other point is that it's going to be different for everyone. Some people are going to be protected, some people are going to be less protected. Um, and it's understanding this individual variability that's going to be important for future treatments and could be arguably one of the reasons why we don't fully understand and can treat these diseases right now. So at the heart of it, it's these di um, metabolic diseases, it comes down to metabolic stress and a mismatch between energy input and energy output. Simple? Not that simple. Because you've got many, many factors that are rolling into this energy out and energy input. Things like your meristing metabolic rate, you can't control that. That's 80% of your energy expenditure. Um, on the energy input, it's what food you like. You can't control what food you like. You can only control what you put in your mouth. But you can argue that may not be completely voluntary either because you can't tell yourself when you're full. You can't tell yourself when you're hungry, when you've um, had enough to eat, what kind of food you want to eat. So it's very technical. And we've got signaling pathways that come in and feed these uh, energy expenditure or what food you intake, how often, what you like. Uh, and these are controlled by both the interaction between the genetics and between the environment. And the combination decide whether you stay in a lean state, whether you transpose uh, to one of obesity, and even whether you are in an obese state or overweight state, and whether this is having complications with diabetes, fatty liver disease, uh, retinopathy, all these things, not everyone gets them. So there's individual genetics and environment interacting to um, understand why some people may be more uh, at risk. So we're, we're interested in the genetics, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and this is to highlight that the lack of genetic research, particularly in the Pacific uh, area and the Polynesia, uh, this is a number of what we call GWAS studies, so gen genome-wide association studies, where you take great big populations of people, look at the whole genomes and see which uh, diseases associate with it. You can see here very, very few in the Pacific region, right? And on an individual level, they don't even make it to the overall graph. Why is this important? Because people of different ancestries have different uh, genetic structures. Um, and this can uh, result in a different phenotype. What works drugs for some people, some patient groups, is very heterogeneous. Some drugs will work better in some people and not in others. Some drugs will be more toxic than others. And understanding what makes us all unique can lead to future treatments of disease. And the problem is, if these genetic type studies aren't happening in people of Polynesian ancestry, there's a potential for in the future for these people to be missing out on these kind of new inventions and new move forward in personalised healthcare. Uh, being sort of the country in Polynesia with the largest resources to do research is where we should be putting our, a lot of um, effort in. So we can talk about pharmacogenetics where we've got drugs that might work better with people with different uh, genetic backgrounds, drugs that could be avoided. There's also things called personal risk scores that are being developed. And these are on top of standard clinical measures like BMI, blood pressure, uh, heart rate, and things like that, that can be used to estimate an individual's risk of uh, developing this disease. Again, this is going to be different for every population. So you need, there's evidently going to be some crossover, but there's going to be a new unique variants only found in populations that need to be discovered. So these can be used to estimate uh, a risk and perhaps someone with a very high risk up the top, this can point towards uh, more invasive or more early procedures to prevent the disease. And those very low risk 
perhaps less cost, more cost effective, more uh, less intensive um, interventions. So stratifying out the health resources to those that are most in need and precision towards those uh, that it's going to be most effective in. So this is our approach we're taking to, to work on this. Um, this is part of the genetic code. Everyone has pretty much the same genes, but within those, all genes are made up of this sequence A, T, G, C. Within these sequence, there's small changes. Uh, this is how we can tell each, we all have our individual characteristics, and if you leave a sample somewhere, we can tell who you are because everyone has difference. Most of these little changes don't do anything or do something very small. But occasionally they add together and add together and you can make larger changes in the phenotype and such as changing your uh, risk for disease. So Tony Meeran's group has sequenced um, 50 people's genome of Polynesian ancestry and looking at some parts of this genome they've found 2,000 variants that are completely unique to this population so almost not found anywhere else in the world. Most of these won't do anything but you know a few of them will and understanding what these do will, will put us forward to understanding risk factors and treatment options. So this is a large cohort that we're looking at association between these variants and disease risk with Tony. Rinky who already spoke today is looking at uh, more clinical populations where we can intervene to change to um, look at the relationship between drugs and treatment options and disease outcome. And what I'm going to spend the next five to ten minutes talking about is our deeper characterization of healthy participants to try and understand underlying mechanisms that might be understood before you get to a disease state, so the prevention rather than treatment option. Uh, just before I go into that, I just want to acknowledge all those that are really involved in this project. As I said, I'm just facing of it today. Uh, this is a nationwide project with people from uh, both Dunedin, Wellington and, and Otago and uh, Auckland, with even some of the Diabetes New Zealand team I can see at the back of me helping us out with recruitment, uh, Ngāti Praora and Moko Foundation up in Kaitaia where we have a research uh, facility. So I'll introduce this slide. The idea is we're recruiting healthy young men, uh, soon to warm up, move on to also women of uh, Polynesian and Pacific ancestry, before any disease develops, to understand risk factors that might lead to the development of disease later down the track. So what we're doing is bringing people in for, a, for a, like fun five hours one day-ish uh, phenotyping, where we can look at things that play a role in development of metabolic disease, such as energy expenditure, uh, a few heart-related measurements there, dietary intake, body composition through a DEXA scan so we can actually look at fat mass, not just BMI. Then we give people a meal, which they're very grateful because before that they're quite hungry. Um, and we can measure the change in their blood glucose and a whole other hormones in the system after a meal and see how they respond to a standardized meal. Then after this, we genotype people for some of the 2,000 variants we've found. Uh, we've just been doing five or six at the moment because it's by hand, but we're, we're moving on to a chip so we can do like 300 at once, which will make it a lot easier. And understand, based on a certain variant, are people responding differently to each of these tests. And then we're moving into uh, what's a recalling participants to understand more detailed of ones that are different genotypes. So these are some of the people involved in the second stage where we're recalling people. Um, Hannah's uh, really been responsible for the initial phenotyping and she's also interested in glucose homeostasis, so blood glucose regulation. Uh, braden has been working with my lab for quite a number of years. He's, he started with this initial phenotyping and he's been doing some stuff um, on uh, muscle size, so a young New Ayan guy, Chris. This is him here. He's, uh, he's working on the immune function, but you can see here he's got the, all the uh, infusions hooked up. He's also one of our participants a few times. <laughs> Theresa is going to be start working on the energy expenditure side of things and Shalinda, I couldn't find a picture of him, he must be really inactive on social media. <laughs> he's, he's, working on, uh, <laughs> he's, he's working on a blood pressure, so some variants were found that associate with blood pressure. Um, I'll just really quickly introduce this again because it's been talked about a couple of times. The sort of flagship variant we're looking at around this project is Kreb RF. There's a variant in this gene that we don't understand this gene, but we know from early work that it associates with an increased body mass index, increased BMI. Um, they Technically, they, they then clone this variant, put it into cells, and they got fatter. 
But the interesting thing, it didn't associate very well with uh, bioimpedance measure of fat mass. So it kind of makes us question whether it's a fat mass gene or a size related gene. And this is particularly interesting because it reduces dramatically reduces the risk of someone developing type 2 diabetes if they have this variant. So if we can understand how this variant is reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes, perhaps this pathway can be targeted in the future for treatment. Or we can stratify people without this variant for earlier interventions. So we're doing some studies to try and uh, understand this. This is just to really highlight normally BMI, and particularly in European population, increased BMI associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes. But it, this doesn't happen with the crab RF variant. Okay, so this is your crab RF variant. This is your change you, in a single nucleotide within a gene that can result in a change of phenotype. So the first question we asked was, do people with a, the same BMI, with and without this variant, have a different body composition? Because you can be overweight, have a BMI of 35, that's in the obese category, and have a lot of fat mass, or you could just be really muscly and strong. Jonah Lomba was a classic example where he had a very high BMI, but he was uh, lean, lean, lean mass, so muscle. So our question is, does the Crab RF variant alter um, fat mass, total fat mass, total lean mass, or could it be altering the distribution of fat mass? As Rinky alluded to with their MRI pictures, if you're storing fat mass really viscerally around your organs, and then you're more likely to develop metabolic related diseases. Whereas if you're putting in subcutaneous fat under the skin, that can expand more and you get a uh, change in secretion from this fat. This is, can even sometimes reduce risk. So what we did, we recruited people of Polynesian ancestry. There's, in this cohort here, there's probably about 150 to 200 people with the, the Crab RF variant. So this is AG at the point, or AA. So this is a shift in the nucleotides, which is normally GG there. Um, we rationalized if this variant was a fat, truly a fat mass associated variant, for the same BMI, people with the Crab RF should have higher fat mass. So we DEXA scan people, and we actually found the opposite. With the Crab RF variant, they tend to have, people tend to have a lower fat mass and a higher lean mass. So supporting our uh, concept, at least in healthy young males, uh, this is not a fat mass associated gene at all. And this could feed into why it's protective from diabetes. We think it's a lean, well, lean mass and overall size related variant. And then we looked a little bit deeper in the, um, this is your subcutaneous fat around the outside and the visceral fat in the middle there. We found very similar between the variants. So, uh, last couple of minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about the work we're trying to do in understanding how it's protecting from type 2 diabetes. Following a meal, right, your blood glucose levels increase. This results in pancreas releasing insulin, which goes in your bloodstream, and allows glucose to be transported into your fat and your muscle cells. Can't get in without the insulin, and it stops glucose being produced from the liver. So under diabetes conditions, we have issues with uh, being unable to stop glucose being produced from the liver, unable to take glucose into the, to the muscle and the fat, and then eventually pancreatic beta cells don't work properly. So these are all aspects that the Crab RF variant could be targeting to change disease risk. So we asked the first question was, did the Crab RF variant change your insulin sensitivity, or does it change your insulin release to protect from type 2 diabetes. Uh, we ran this procedure called a uh, euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamp. Uh, basically what you're doing is infusing uh, insulin in at a set dose for everyone and then also infusing glucose. Insulin will make your blood glucose go down so we infuse glucose to bring it back up to a normal level. The more glucose you need to infuse uh, the more insulin sensitive someone is. So it's very a very accurate measure of insulin sensitivity. We also measured things like fasting blood glucose and HbA1c. And we found no difference between the groups. This is the amount of glucose we infused. This is the calculated how sensitive they are to insulin. Very similar. So that was quite surprising because we thought people with the Crab RF variant are going to be more insulin sensitive. They've got more lean mass. Uh, that's how they're going to be protected from type 2 diabetes. We didn't find that at all. Um, what we also did is an a intravenous glucose tolerance test. We infuse a really large bolus of glucose and follow the change in blood glucose. It goes up, 15 millimolar, pretty high, and then comes back down. 
uh, very similarly in both groups. But we, what we're starting to see now with our group is that there tends to be an increase in insulin being released uh, in response to glucose and an increase in C-peptide, which, which is a precursor for insulin and it's a better measure of overall insulin release. So what we think is that the Krebara variant is protecting from type 2 diabetes by improving the beta cell function, so the ability of the pancreas to release insulin. Um, and that's kind of a graphical model of we, our hypothesis around this, is that when you're normoglycemic, your blood glucose is sitting around here, your, your beta cell function is really good, but when you go into this progression of prediabetes, your pancreas has to work harder because we need to lower the blood glucose levels. So you increase your ability for insulin to be released, but at some point this decreases. And this is around the transition point to type 2 diabetes, which is actually a longer, a longer progression line. We think people perhaps with the Krebs RF variant are able to prolong their ability of their beta cells to function. And gives us, gives us some new targets for, for type 2 diabetes management. Um, Again, this is just a hypothesis of what we think. We don't have that much evidence to support this, and that's what we're walking towards with these studies. Uh, just a last thank you to the team for all those involved that I put on the earlier slide. And last slide, we're recruiting, so anyone who's interested in being involved, we've got pamphlets. Talk to the guys at the back, they'll put you in contact. Thank you. <laughs>